You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 134 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is writer, journalist, TV personality, Jessica Salagi. Wow, that was very emphatic. Thank you for that. <laughs> you really emphasized. Eric's put in some, he's put in some applause there. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want like sprinkles, like fairy dust sprinkles, like Tinkerbell or something. Something magical. Sprinkles. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> it's not like that kind of show. So, so I hear you have a new male friend in your life and he's a real hound that gets around. Yes, I was going to bring him up. So I'm glad you did. Um, this is the second week that um, Stanley, I named him Stanley, has been staying with us. Um, he's a black lab mix of sorts. And, you know, I have a black lab already, Stella, and a yellow lab, Shady. Um, and this guy just kept showing up on the porch and I told him to go away and to skit you know, and I even put then up. Then he didn't go away, so I put his picture on Facebook, and all the lost and found groups called the vet, took him to see if he was chipped, called the shelters to see if there were any reports. No, nothing. Um, and he would just sit on my front porch. It was the saddest thing, like because it's covered, so he was in the shade, and so I was like, "All right, well, you can stay until I find you a good family." <laughs> so. Um, it's been two weeks and, and he initially was sleeping out in the fenced in area. And then I moved him to the porch on, on a crate and now he sleeps in the bathroom and I got him his own little blanket and he sleeps on a bed and he snores and he gets along mostly fine with Shady and Stella. And if I had a bigger house and a bigger wallet, I would keep him, but, um, he's going to be rehomed, so. But his name is Stanley, and he's a very good boy. And he's not fixed. He's not. Which means that you are the best possible thing for that dog, because his owners were crappy. You know, there's been a few times... I mean, obviously he knew in my yard, like, there's there's dog toys. It smells like dogs. He, he, I'm, he There were a couple of times when he would go by our house... Um, when we were out there and it's funny, I told him to go home one time and he went to the house across the street and sat in their yard and stared at my house. Like, is this far enough? Um, but he obviously understands. He knows his (laughs) commands. He, um, he is super loving and loves when you pet him and he is crate trained. And if he wasn't crate trained, then he just picked it up super fast in hopes of staying here but I mean, he's, he's mellow and I don't, I don't put him up. He stays in my yard all day long and doesn't, he'll get off the porch and go wander around in the yard, but he doesn't leave. So he clearly had a family at one time. And anytime I really start thinking about it, it just makes me livid because I know that somebody just put him in the car and either dropped him off in my end of the county or came from another county and they just left him. And, um, when I advertised him on Facebook to see if anyone was missing him, a friend of mine who lives about 15 miles away said that he was on his porch in the rain about three or four months ago. And he let him in and sleep in the laundry room for the night with his other dog. And then Stanley left the next morning and he didn't see him again, but that was 15 miles away three months ago. And he's just been making do because people are awful and because people suck. Well, a responsible pet owner also leaves a mud unfixed. Yes. I mean, I I understand if, if you're breeding dogs, which, you know, my dog's a mud. <clears throat> if, uh, if you're breeding dogs, it's one thing. But if you're, even if it was an accident where you have a dog that roams, there's no reason to have him out making puppies that are, that are going to end up in a, in a shelter or get, getting run over, not, not being cared for. Uh, but I, I hear that you're going to get them fixed. I am. So, I mean, I, like I will, I'm, I'm going to do some things to make him more marketable, I suppose. Um, and I know that, that, I mean, 
if I were to keep him, I would want him to be fixed for a number of reasons. But um, and if he's going to be an outdoor dog like that, but if somebody wants him and they're going to give him a loving home, but they're concerned about like that cost or something, then that's not going to be a deterrent. So, so let that be a lesson. If you show up on Jessica's front porch uninvited, she will cut your nuts off. <laughs> yep. <laughs> How was your week? Uh, we, my week was good. My week was good. It's st- still hot. It's still Georgia. I think uh, the week that this show drops, it's going to be a little more moderate, which will allow us to catch up on our on a lot of our work that's been piling up. But it's been good. It's been good. I, I'm, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. So anything that keeps me off the streets. That's we true. do want to mention Big Daddy Unlimited, who is a sponsor for this show. Uh, they are a direct source for everything that goes bang. Guns, uh, Class 3 items like silencers, uh, SBRs, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns. Uh, those take a little more paperwork. Get ammo shipped directly to you. Get accessories shipped directly to you. If you do decide to buy a gun, you have it shipped to your local gun shop. You fill out the 4473 there. And unless you are a prohibited person, you walk right out the door with your brand new gun and go, uh, hopefully you have something to feed it and go to the range and start planking. So big thanks to Big Daddy Unlimited for being the first sponsor of our humble show. And Jessica, you were the you were the first, so I, I know you heard of this, about Hurricanes Paulette and Hurricane Renee teaming up to wreak havoc. I mean, you know that that is... Not a coincidence, right? I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> two of the first female lawmakers in the state. I mean, two of the worst. Paulette's former now, but she, her, I mean, and they're back to back. Please. Watch them both hit Georgia. Well, they did before with their I'm legislative str- records. God. <laughs> Wreck havoc. I'm like, you spelled HVAC wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that is, that is, a, that, that is amusing. And your post was amusing. And it's one of those things where uh, I found it funny. So I shared it. I guess my, the friends on Facebook did, did not find it as amusing as I did. Of course, most of my friends are less politically aware of what's going on in Georgia and wouldn't know who the hell Renee Unterman is anyway. Which, after uh, inauguration in January, she will be a regular nobody and she can move on with whatever it is that she does. Which, I don't know what it is. What is she? She's a nurse, right? No. She's not a nurse. Her nursing license or whatever expired in the 80s. She works for the state's largest Medicaid contractor and did the entire time she was the Senate Health and Human Services chair. Will she continue to be worth having in that role if she's no longer making laws? Well, (laughs) so the Senate GOP COVID relief bill fails. The chances of a bipartisan deal before elections dim. A $300 billion GOP bill versus the $3 trillion Democrat proposal. Good God. Did you know it was $3 trillion? I did not know until I was doing research for this show. I mean, I knew it was a lot, but I don't watch the, I don't watch like network and that kind of like pundit shows around the clock or anything. And I guess that was back in May, I think, May or June, so I had kind of forgotten. But And of course, Rand Paul was uh, the lone Republican joining Senate Democrats to oppose it. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, missed the vote. I guess uh, it's too important to try to get her next job. Well, and three. I mean, the House three version trillion. was three. It's a, just a giant number. Sorry. No, Sorry. it's Go. okay. I was just going to say the one they voted on last week was the 300 billion. The House already approved the 3 trillion in earlier in the summer and that's what Republicans were like, "Heck no. You know, we ain't doing it." 
Speaker, Speaker Pelosi, once her hair dried, said, it's a missed opportunity to do what is right for the American people. And Dems want at, a, at least $2 trillion, which the Trump administration rejects as unnecessary overreach. Wow, it's kind of funny when you hear statists use words like overreach. Yeah, I don't think it means what you think it means. Yeah, like we're okay for some overreach, but this would be unnecessary overreach. So we can tell you what contracts you can collect money on. That's not overreach. But this, well, this is just a bridge too far. And, and I'm not stumping for, for spending $2 trillion. So no. Trust me, I'm not. I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I would just like government to get the hell out of the way, let people open back up. And honestly, it's at this point, it's not the Fed that's holding businesses back from putting people back to work. It's the states. Yeah. What New York said uh, restaurants can open up, I think, mid-month with... 25 percent capacity well how in the hell uh, restaurants are already a thin margin business it, it takes it takes volume it's one of the reasons that you you kind of you kind of get rushed through a meal you know you're just sitting there uh talking and they and uh, they have reservations backing up that you know it, they won't ask you to leave but it's apparent that you're that you're eating up a table because uh, they have they have to turn those tables. That's the only way these restaurants make business. The only way they make payroll. How the hell do you with your business plan? Do you say okay, we're going to reduce by seventy five percent and stay in business and keep people employed? No. And then on top of that, you know, the states are allocating out the federal or the the states were reimbursed for the three hundred dollars a week for the last what not uh, six weeks I think because people are going to be getting eighteen hundred dollar payments. Some of them will come in to $900 payments, just depending on the situation. But we're, we're back paying people for a lull. And there are jobs out there. Like there are people hiring. I'm not saying that 100% employment, but my goodness, we're still at unprecedented numbers. We are. And a lot of, uh, you're right, people are hiring and they're not necessarily the most desirable jobs in the world, but the jobs are out there. At some point, you have to let the market correct. You have to let the market do what it's going to do. Uh, and I know a lot of people who typically make very good money. A lot of people in the airline industry uh, that are going that are down to working one or two days a week that are that have had their their income slashed, but they're not on they're not on the unemployment number because they still they still work. And they're still employed, and it's not technically a pay cut, but their hours have been slashed so much that. That it's it's if you were living at your means, it would be very difficult to, to continue on with 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 it. Hopefully, most people I know have some savings and, and can can live. But it's it's been it's been really hard on a, on a lot of industries. But yeah, you know, there are a lot of restaurants owners that are just going to fold up. They're just not going to make it. Did you see where the airline industry wants another bailout? I have no doubt. No, I haven't seen it, but I have no doubt. I mean, it's never enough. And and there's another thing. Right. There's another one about the farmers. And I'm I'm super sympathetic to farmers, not because I mean they receive subsidies and it's super manipulated. But the government has ruined farming. If if the government obviously they can't just stop everything at once because it will collapse. But I mean they control the input and the output. It's, it's the only industry where they don't get to set their own prices. But aside from all of that, there's there was an article that came out that said, um, and Democrats are really hammering Trump about it, that 82 percent of farmers are going to report a loss this year and all these things. And I'm thinking, well, farmers were they struggle every year. They have a couple good years and then they have a couple bad years. And but it's it's not unusual. Like farmers are not. The, the ideal way to gauge the economy. Of course, we want our farmers to thrive because we don't want them to go out of business and to stop farming, but they're not the typical American household. Most of them get paid once a year. Right. And this has the the restaurant consumption of food obviously went way down. Uh, I know that milk producers were dumping, I mean, 
hundreds of thousands of gallons, if not millions of gallons of milk because they can't get it to market. The schools, the schools uh, closing they, hurt them big time. Sure it did. Plus the the materials they need, you can't you can't just sell milk. It has to go in a carton and that carton has to be produced. And when the factory that, that produces cartons shuts down, you know, obviously I know this in my industry, uh, when... When the factory is shut down, you can't do anything with it. You, you, how, how the hell are you going to put the milk into the container if you can't get containers? And milk is perishable, so they, they're just they're destroying, uh, they're destroying literally tons of milk. Uh, and of course, restaurants aren't aren't consuming fresh vegetables. Restaurants aren't cons- we're not consuming uh, the meat that they typically buy. So just everything from the farmers to distributors like Buckhead Beef. Uh, or were all hurting because they had they had no customers. Uh, luckily, Georgia is opening back up, and I I don't know what the restaurant scene in Atlanta looks like because I just haven't been I haven't gone out to eat in Atlanta in quite a while, and and I, and I don't know what restrictions uh, are down in Atlanta right now. But I can tell you out here, every restaurant that's open is at whatever capacity they're allowed to have. There are every Friday night. There are lines in Hiram to, to get a hell just to get a to go order from a place like Longhorn. I think uh, Low a couple weeks ago was was going to uh, somebody in our group was going to go uh, pick up Longhorn, take it home, and the, the wait for takeout was an hour and a half. Well, there's definitely a lot of people who want to support their small businesses, and I, I think that's wonderful. I mean, and, and and it's not just I mean Longhorn's not a small business, but just but people understand that like sure we're all kind of uncertain about what's to come and and the economic position of everything, but that it's only going to get worse if we don't spend some money. You know, groceries alone will not keep the economy going. Um, But you mentioned um, like at capacity and stuff in restaurants. And I just wanted to mention this hilarious statistic or not even a statistic, but point from the CDC last week they released, you know, they're constantly releasing new reports and, they said that basically um, dining out is one of the most dangerous activities that you can do because you're there for an extended period of time and then you don't wear a mask while you're eating and drinking, obviously. But they based it off of interviews they had with 314 people who were experiencing symptoms of the virus and got tested. And those people, um, half of them roughly, tested positive. And then they said that their conclusion was that people who tested positive were two times as likely than those who tested negative to say that they had dined in a restaurant. But, I mean, like they're making, it just shows you the type of recommendations that businesses are getting and they're struggling based on these half-hearted attempts of what 314 people who were already feeling sick said and without taking into, like they didn't, we don't know if they went through the drive-thru at the bank and touched the little the thing or if they touch the ATM or if they were at the grocery store or if they have a home health care worker who comes into their home and may have spread it to them. I mean, it's stupid. Yeah, absolutely. The The data is horrible. Garbage in, garbage out. Mm-hmm. Um, it was 314 people, which is a tiny sample size, that were already showing symptoms, half of which showed uh, came came up hot for COVID. So we, we now we're down to half and half of those say they went to a restaurant and there's no time frame of when you went, when, when you went to a restaurant, there's, there's, there's nothing. There's the, the data is garbage. I mean, the fact that they released this is, is helpful to no one. Data has um, to have context. Yes. And I'm not saying it's over, I mean, understated because I don't believe that it is, but you're also, when you when you interview like this, it's not like they had on GPS tracking devices or had to log everywhere they went or anything like that. You, you, you're you leaving out people who may not have admitted where they went or may have been dishonest. Like, you're, you're, or they may not have been honest. Maybe they didn't go to a restaurant and say that they did. I mean, you have, there's, there's no, like, no reliability. And right. you're making economic and decisions for business owners on it. it it's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely irresponsible. The, the study itself was, is irresponsible because the data is is skewed. It's not like they, they started going to restaurants and, t- and testing testing people and, and taking data. How many times a week do you visit a restaurant and then start ch- charting that data? The people that 
then now we start getting context where the people that visit restaurants three times a week were twice as likely to to test positive versus people who go go to a restaurant once a month. That data might actually be useful, and that study might actually be useful. But just taking three hundred fourteen or whatever it is uh, st- symptomatic people. And then breaking down by half who who actually tested positive, and then say, okay, well, how many of you went to a restaurant? Go, oh, you see, restaurants are bad. They started with a conclusion and worked their way back to it, which is crap science. Agree. And that, and that, and that's yeah. You know, tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, but that's but that's what the government does is they start with a conclusion and work their way back to it. It is same same thing they do with a lot of the climate change stuff. It, it, it is absolutely awful science and it's in, they try to put it in, in a way that, that people think they're smart when they quote the CDC and it's garbage and it's irresponsible and it's going to do nothing to help business owners. It's going to do nothing to help anyone because when, when those businesses go, go out of business, your, your, your choices are now reduced. When you, when, when you lose that, that local bar, that local restaurant, uh, that, you lose that as a choice in your life. They, not only do they lose their their living, the owner's now unemployed. Most of these folks aren't rich. The the wait staff, the cooks, everybody else is now on the street trying to find a job because of some horrible piece of piece of data that came out that really tells us nothing. So anyway, off my soapbox, and on to New Hampshire, where a v- woman voted topless, and I love this story. After she was told she couldn't wear a political shirt in the polling location, did you? It was. Ca- I was going to say, did you catch one of the, the first reports where they said the headlines were that it was a Trump shirt? I mean, it, and that's not technically inaccurate, but that makes you think that the voter was pro-Trump, and it was actually an anti-Trump shirt, an anti-Trump person. Yeah, I caught that. Yeah, the. And I and I'm almost wondering if that's not a regional thing when they when they run those headlines, or if it's something that that they put out two stories, used Facebook al- algorithms and stuff to put it out. Is is it got more right wing clicks saying Trump t shirt made her take off a Trump t shirt mm-hmm. and, and she voted topless. And if if it was in Seattle, they would say wearing anti Trump t shirt in order to stir up both bases and get that get that click. Right. Uh, quote from a poll worker. I said I'd rather she not, but she took it off so fast no one had time to react. So the whole place just went whoa, and she walked away. And I uh, and I let her vote. She could have just gone into the hallway and turned it inside out. Sure, she could have. And of, so you go, go ahead. I said, and of course, this was a primary in which Trump was not on the ballot. It was a local primary. Does that change your opinion of whether or not she should have been allowed to wear the shirt? Yes and no. The fact that it's not, I don't think that, that any shirt, you should be able to wear any shirt you want it, it, within, within, uh, within legal guidelines, I guess. I mean, of, of appropriateness in, in whatever municipality you are. Obviously, you can't wear a thong if you're in Myrtle Beach. Uh, but I, I have a real problem with, with the law itself. Because if unless you're actively campaigning, yeah, but but yeah, I have a problem with the law it's, itself. Now, if if within the law, if if we set that aside till uh, for a couple minutes and say, do I think it violates existing law? No, it absolutely doesn't because she's not campaigning for a candidate. There was Trump was not a candidate in that election. So whether it said uh, whether she was wearing a MAGA shirt. Or if she's wearing a uh, an anti-Trump uh, shirt, it doesn't matter. He's not on the damn ballot, right? And I am so going to wear a uh, uh, a Trump shirt to go vote and go sh- vote shirtless, and just make everybody just vomit. <laughs> Lovely. Or that either that or I'm going to wear a I'm going to buy a MAGA uh, face mask. I know you said you'd never wear uh, political things just to, just to have to make the decision whether are you telling me I have to take off my personal protective gear or can I vote? Well, you should ask you them. No, no, what? No, 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 no. Don't you mess that up. You ask them if you can borrow their mask and you'll bring it right back. <laughs> the problem is they might say yes. <laughs> 
So we'll turn it inside out. So you want me blowing whatever was on the inside yeah. of the mask back out at everybody? Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> but you know, I won't do. I, I act, yeah, I talk a big game. I won't actually do it because the nice people that actually work the polls. Yes, I have a lot of sympathy for, and I. As, again, I talk a big game, but I'm not going to make life hard on the people who volunteer their time all day on election day to put up with people bitching about lines uh, and are especially, you know, in where I vote. Everybody is so nice, so polite. Uh, thank you for voting. Come, come on in. Uh, they're just super, super helpful. I wouldn't actually do that to them. But it's funny. And, and, and I put a premium on on comedy because, I you know. Uh, we were talking before. I don't say things to make other people laugh. I say things to amuse me, and I do things to amuse me. And other people, other people laugh. It's a bonus. So if anybody else has my sick sense of humor, I can pretty well pick you out when you laugh at the stupid crap that I say. But uh, we you know, we have the Georgia's law on campaigning loca- uh, campaigning and locations. It's 150 feet, right, from the door. Like, you can't wear anything in there. But our our law is super specific. Yeah, no pe- person shall solicit votes in any manner or by any means or method, nor shall any person distribute it or display any campaign literature, newspaper, booklet, pamphlet, card, sign, paraphernalia, or any other written or printed matter of any kind, nor shall any person solicit signatures for any petition or conduct any exit poll or public opinion poll with voters on the day in which ballots are being cast, with 150 feet of the outer edge of any building within which a polling place is established, within the polling, or within 25 feet of any voter standing in line at any polling place. Right, which is to encompass, you know, they went back and did that later because the lines were so long, so people would be 200 feet from the door waiting and someone would campaign. So they did that to don't touch the voters. Don't touch the voters. Please keep your hands inside for, for your own safety. Voters may have been known to bite, and please don't feed them. That leads to dependence. Yes. You know, I, I have a real problem with, with the idea of wearing a shirt. And that being that being considered uh, campaign material, because mm-hmm. it's just not. It's not. It's not. If if you're wearing a, if you're wearing somebody's face on the shirt, or you're wearing somebody's name on your shirt. It's it's not campaigning. Uh, in, in the case of this woman, it, because Trump was on the ballot, she might have well been wearing a Rush T-shirt or a a, a, a Ted Nugent shirt or anything like that. It just he's not on the ballot. It's it's not it's not an issue. I think that you're you start meddling with with free speech at that point when you start telling people what they're allowed to wear on their shirts. Well, and and campaign material. SCOTUS has ruled that. I mean, they've they've given the states the leeway to regulate this if it's super narrow, because I think in Minnesota, theirs was overturned because it was too vague. Um but I still don't agree with that either. I mean, even if it's super specific and if you if you limited it to just the candidates, that's not right, because that would mean that the candidate's wife could go campaign, but the candidate himself cannot because he gives up his right to speech when he's running for office. I mean, it, it just it's stupid. And it's they say that it's to, it's to avoid intimidation. And sure, we all have the right to Go cast a vote free of, you know, outside influence or being forced to do something one way or the other. But we don't have a right not to 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 be in a bubble from other people's opinions and and preferences and to suggest that we do via the law to me is is overreach. But well. I don't have a problem with limiting active campaigning, walking up and down the line, handing pamphlets. It's free speech, but if, if if we want to say we don't we don't want people standing right outside the polls as you go in to give your ID and handing out campaign literature, that, that, you know that's besides mm-hmm. anything else is tacky. Yes, it's tacky to do that. 
but to tell you know individual voters that they can't wear their MAGA hat, they can't wear their Biden T-shirt. Uh, you can't. You, they can't wear a, a T-shirt that says hashtag Dem or anything else to say that's campaign material. I, I think is too much. And you know what? This woman's protest got got this in the news, and it's getting the idea of telling people what they can wear to the polls press. Because had she just gone and turned it inside out, she would put a a, a twenty cent or twenty word statement on Twitter, and that would have been the end of it. And her friends would have gone, "Well, that's bull," and it would have been over with. But the fact that she did that, she that she uncased the twins and went and voted, that really highlights for you, it highlights for the press that this this is an issue. Well, and the the Minnesota case is evident of how it's so sub like subjective to what the poll worker or the enforcer thinks is political because that case where the Minnesota law was struck down was started by the t-shirts and buttons that said please ID me well that's all about context and you can't just say well that's I mean it, it either is political speech all the time or it isn't and Please ID me matters when certainly matters where and how you use it. Unless the ID law was was on the ballot. And then and it, and again, the law's stupid anyway, but it, it can only be campaigning if there was a ballot initiative to mm-hmm. require IDs, the polls. Otherwise, it's again, has nothing to do with that election. And, and again, it was overturned by by SCOTUS. Right. So I the the extreme measures that that this woman took are you know you again tacky and uncalled for but it was a response that got attention and got us talking about this and that's and that's a good thing ultimately yes very dramatic so though. was it your page or somewhere else that I, I saw someone talking about the story that they were told they couldn't vote with a shirt that had the Gadsden flag on it Oh gosh, I don't know. That's that's bad. Yeah, and and of course, Gaston flag is is the rattlesnake. Don't tread on me. Uh, or in the case of uh, a lot of people, tread harder, Daddy. Uh, but the, but the but the the shirt itself, they made him go and turn it inside out to go vote because they said it was it was campaign material. And again, it, you're absolutely right. It is 100% up to the discretion of that poll worker. So what are you going to do? You're going to make a scene at the polls. Everybody, everybody behind you is already aggravated because because you're taking you're taking more than the 30 seconds it takes to give your ID and get your ballot. So they're already pissed off that 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 this is happening. And then you put a poll worker, most likely a volunteer, in the position of having to tell somebody you can't wear that in here. Yeah. So it 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 was a, uh, and of course that's that's an anecdote, and I and I've heard lots of lots of anecdotes about what they consider campaign material and what they don't. So, yeah, the please ID me. The obviously if 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 you're wearing uh, pro candidate stuff, that's pretty that's pretty easy to identify as okay. Well, that it that qualifies in the law as as being printed. Uh, uh, that that you're that you're displaying. That's that's pretty easy. But you do things like. Uh, like uh, the Gaston flag, or I don't even know what an anti-Trump thing would be. Uh, but in a, if it if it's up to left up to interpretation, who do we want interpreting that law? And 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 what do you do? They're they're guilty of a misdemeanor for doing it. So I would much rather them let vote and then have them arrested for the misdemeanor and let it let it play out in court. Well, and per- then we could actually per- overturn some of these stupid laws. Yeah, perhaps we need a few fewer laws that are so subjective in. I mean, yes, all of there's discretion all the time, but there's a difference between officer discretion and subjectivity based on who's reading it. And I mean, enough already. Right. And and, and again, it's going to lead to Karens who are complaining. Is Most of these poll workers just want to get it's a long day. They just want to get through it. They're, they're doing it. Out, they're doing it out of, out of civic duty. Uh, most most of the poll workers are. are are people who are, you know, not to be overly uh, generalize, generalized anything, but the poll workers just want to get through the day. They're volunteering. A lot of them are retired. It's, it's a good opportunity to get out and interact with people and, and 
and they're just kind of being thrown in, thrown into this role of of deciding what you can wear that's appropriate. It'd be a lot easier if the law in, in Georgia were cleaned up, saying that T-shirts are excluded, or uh, you cannot display a candidate's name uh, that that is on the ballot. Be be specific about it. And I don't own a Gadsden flag T-shirt, but I just might go get one. And, and again, I don't think I'll have any, I'd have any problems in Paulding County anyway, because it's it it does again our our local government and things that go on here are so just laid back and we're still, we're still, you know, we're part of Metro Atlanta. We're still pretty country out here. Yeah. And I, do, I know you guys are certainly down there. Oh yeah. When you have dogs, when you have dogs just show up on your front porch. Like, well, I guess he's mine. That's what Connie did. If you didn't, well, that's exactly what she did. She took an astray. <laughs> Cut my nuts off and let me in the house. <laughs> oh boy! They're, they're now they're now uh, safely in her purse. Where they belong? <laughs> Where they belong? Absolutely. It's like you won't need those anymore. That's funny. If you didn't know, it's still uncool to meet with people from opposing political parties if you're trying to appease your fan base. Did you see this this the- week? I did not. I did not. I, I and I don't even know who this guy is. I mean, I understand that he was. All right, anyway, let's, the internet erupted once again when Governor Kemp and Killer Mike met to discuss a number of issues, including human trafficking. Yeah, so I, I, he's a rapper. Yeah, I, I figured that wasn't just a. I mean, I, I assume Mama didn't name him Killer. Well, you never know, but not, it doesn't seem that way, but, you know, he's, he's, this isn't his first time in the political realm either. He was the one that was standing next to Keisha Lance Bottoms at the press conference when she was like, you guys need to go home. You know, no, don't, don't tear our city apart. This is not who we are. He was one of the ones that spoke that night and he took some flack for standing with her and not, I mean for calling to for the ends to the violence but so he he's been a i don't really know why he rose to that position to be a spokesperson in a sense but he he is it's not his first time well and again i that that's the first time i was aware of somebody named killer mike is watching that that press conference uh, and i thought that was one of her better moments yes uh, since then since then, she's aged fifty years, and uh, and her response has been a lot more limp wristed, and uh, she's gone into trying to appease the mob rather than than uh, uh, than calm than to suppress violence. But anyway, the story's not not about her. Look, Bono and uh, Forty Three ha- have been friends since they met in the early two thousands. Uh, because because of Bono's work with AIDS in Africa and and Bush's support uh, of that effort, and I don't think that you would find two people that are probably politically apart than Bono of U two and George W Bush, but on this one issue they they found common ground on, on an issue and found that they like each other, and they were able to work for a common uh, a common goal. And in the case of human trafficking. Why wouldn't you want your governor reaching out to every group possible? And if Killer Mike speaks to a demographic that is not going to hear what Kemp and Georgia's First Lady have to say on the subject, why not use a, a, a key communicator that's going to reach out to a community that may not be tuned in to listen to what Kemp has to say? Well, and, and there were people, there were lots of people arguing on Kemp's page and on the tweets about or by Killer Mike and all this stuff and and people were defending it on both sides saying like why wouldn't you want these people why wouldn't if if you want change why don't you have a seat at the table or have somebody sit there who's going to vocalize our concerns or you know whatever the case may be I don't I want policymakers to talk to as many people as possible um, you know, Kim Kardashian, like we made fun of her for going to the White House or was it her, Connie? I can't remember, but we made fun of her involvement. But the the point of the matter is 
as messy and just a problem as much as much as she is all of those things she has a voice we there are people who believe what she believes and so people in power and decision makers should hear that voice if she represents it for somebody else i don't since when is that bad well in a, in my previous life we use key communicators look if a bunch of american soldiers come and put a message out to, to a population, there it's going to be from us, and it's going to be taken with a huge grain of salt. But when you get a a local key communicator on board, whether it's their local mayor, whether it's cleric, or just a prominent business person in the area who is able to take that message and say, "Yes, this is I agree with this. This is what needs to happen." That message gains credibility so much faster than than me just hammering. A, a group of people that are not susceptible to what I'm saying anyway, because it comes from me. Using a using a, a key communicator on a on a subject that generally we all agree on, this is bad. Yeah. Holding people against their will and and trading them and and using and putting them in slavery is wrong, and, and we all agree on that. Dep- doesn't matter where where we've what we feel about national debt, about gun control or anything else is on this subject. We agree that we need, this is, this is a, you know, if you were to, to draw one of those circle diagrams, this is where all the circles, in, uh, they, they all intersect at this point where we say human trafficking is wrong, it's disgusting, and it needs to be stopped. And it doesn't matter where you are in the political spectrum. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, Hispanic, uh, or Inuit. It doesn't matter. We all, all civilized people agree that this is disgusting and wrong and needs to stop. How we get there is somewhere is something that, that you can have a discussion with people from the left and the right. And if Killer Mike is, has, has a platform in order to get that message out with, look, if you know somebody in your neighborhood that's involved in this, it is, it's your obligation to, to report it. If, if, if even just one person in a, in a neighborhood says, sees something and says, you know what, this is what Killer Mike was talking about. And I don't care if it's Kim Kardashian. I don't care if it's Kanye. I, I don't care if it's James Woods. I don't care what, whatever voice gets into gets in somebody's ear and works its way to their brain and says, oh, oh, that's what they were talking about. Exactly. That's I, And so the message message is lost when people get lost in the when people get lost in the woods and go well why is Kemp meeting with him somebody named killer and then on his side it's like why would why would killer mike waste his time talking to a republican and it's it's that sort of divisiveness that that allows evil to thrive and there's nothing that you can call human trafficking that isn't evil Right. And instead of talking about the actual issue or just raising awareness about human trafficking in general, we're arguing about who should and should not have a conversation. Right. And who's worthy of having a conversation with you. And that and that is that's repulsive that you that you would rather uh, this keep going on than to have the message carried by somebody that you just don't like. And of course, these are our opinions and not those of All on Georgia and certainly not those of any All on Georgia not offering commentary on the show. And certainly any of our opinions do not reflect the opinions of our sponsor, Big Daddy Unlimited. Big thanks to them. So is the city of freedom coming to Georgia? Currently, it's just a community uh, where a 97-acre piece of land in Wilkinson County was purchased by 19 black families, all of whom have settled the land with the vision of creating a new community. Their yeah. stated goal was to create a safe haven for black Americans. Uh, quote, we want especially our black families to come to be pioneers with us. Uh, <laughs> so, of course, I'm against adding a city because it's more government and we have too many cities. I want to get rid of all of them and either go back to counties or I want to get rid of counties and just have cities or, or something. I, I just I don't like how we have so much. And 
Wilkinson County, if you don't know where it is, it's like in the triangle. If you were to draw lines from Macon to Milledgeville and down to Dublin and then back up to Macon, it's, it's in the middle over there. But it's a small county. They only have 9,000 people and they already have seven cities. And there's a couple counties that I cover that are about this size, like Evans County, and they have three cities, um, three or four, but there is four, but there's already two, two, too many cities for that. And they have 10,000 people. So I'm, I'm against them from, from that perspective, I'm against another city. And then I'm against it because if you look at the, the conditions, which we're going to talk about of how you become a city, um, we all know that cities are required to offer at least three services. It doesn't mean you have to have police. It doesn't mean you have to have fire, but you have to offer something, be it water, sewer, a library, a park, um, planning and zoning. And then you have to have meetings. So literally, instead of just having a lovely community where um, you just live, they want to make it more expensive for everybody and have people rule over each other. If this was about freedom, let me just say something here. If this was about freedom, they would want to have their little compound and they would try to lay as low as possible and do their own thing and be self-sufficient off in their unincorporated area of the county and be a community instead of that shares values instead of a government that requires certain values. Right. And I'm not, there are a lot of cities, I don't know exactly what they add yeah. for, for the residents of the city. Uh, Dallas. Dallas has a small police force. Uh, it does, they do trash, not well. Uh, from what I understand, the, tra- the trash cans are smaller and you don't have a, a chance to hire a trash company. You have to use the city. Uh, they have sewer. I think they have... Uh, they have their own treatment plant and they have water and a couple other things, but I'm not sure what it benefits the people of Dallas to have that additional layer of government. Whereas mm-hmm. if you live in the County, we still have sheriff protection. We still have, we still have fire. Uh, we have everything that the, that the County, that the County taxes provide. Uh, obviously the, if, even in the city, kids go to County schools. So we already pay taxes to the county. And if you own a uh, house in the city of Dallas, your county taxes aren't reduced. Right. You just, you have an additional layer of taxes that, that go to the city for a bunch of people that don't, that don't do anything for you. Uh, I mean, other than they put some like obelisk looking things uh, coming into Dallas that were, I think were part of Obama money or something to, to put up like brick uh, things to say, welcome to Dallas. And there's a fountain that they spend a bunch of like federal money putting a fountain in. That's, that's about it. Oh, that the, the city doesn't do anything for the people. The only thing I do like about the cities and, and this is, this is where you, we're going to disagree in Paulding County. You cannot have a liquor store. But in Hiram and Dallas, you can because mm-hmm. the cities and the counties were given equal authority to choose that. So, da- uh, Paulding County, I won't say it's dry because you can buy beer, wine in the grocery stores, but there are you, but you can't buy liquor. And I think it was quite the coup to get liquor by the drink. So you can go to a restaurant in Paulding County and and they'll, they'll pour you they'll pour you a drink, but you can't go buy a bottle of bourbon and take it home and drink it home and not drive anywhere. Well, that, that makes super sense because, you know, you know, God hates alcohol. Sorry, Jess, go ahead. No, I was just going to say you're what you're presenting, though, is a total dichotomy between metro counties and rural counties and why some of our counties are just no matter how you cut it, for lack of a better word, um, they're just too small because in, in I, I grew up in Fulton County and I lived in Roswell and I lived in Alpharetta and the cities there made sense because Fulton County simply could not provide the services that people wanted. And, and, and from the city perspective, I do support people. Like, I mean, I, I under, I support the concept of if you want to have additional government and you want to pay for it, then, um, do that. But what I have a problem with with regards to the cities is they get all this state funding. A lot of times they then they get grants and stuff and they take away from counties. And so then the county governments continue to suffer 
and the cities thrive and and then and then you have more cities because the counties continue to suffer and it's just this vicious cycle but in in the bigger counties where there's more area and there's more people and and all these things it it, it at least makes sense even if i don't always agree with it with these counties that we're talking about and a lot of the ones that i cover if if you have 9000 people i guarantee you that no more than 25 people determine an election outcome and to meet the standards by georgia law to be a city these 97 acres here these people they need they're talking about needing about 200 families to join i mean your the the difference between getting involved and having a change in the community and affecting the change of your county and engaging people to to go towards the change that you want is more practical than adding another layer of government. Sure. And look, a city has to be one square mile, so they don't have enough land. They don't have the density. Uh, what is it? At least 200 people per square mile. Mm-hmm. Uh, they need 520 the- more acres. They That's a lot of five land. Times, five times what they already have. Mm-hmm. In order to buy it, you know, it's it's all private. So it's, I, I don't I don't think I think this is a pie in the sky. I, th- I think that your your idea of let's just create our own community, put, put up a, a advertise to who we, who we want to move here, and then we'll create a I don't know some sort of commune. I don't really care. That makes way more way more sense. Uh, Financially, other than if you want to make a political statement and say this is our city, this is the city of freedom. I don't, if you want, if if the county wants to appease them, throw up a sign that says "Freedom Unincorporated." Right. In fact, those two words go great together. <laughs> exactly. Freedom un- Unincorporated. That that says freedom to me way more than "Welcome to the city of freedom." Uh, don't speed, or we'll give you a ticket. And and just I know we were running low on time, but. They, there was a quote in one of the articles and one of the members said, we just want to have a space, a place where black people and pro-black people can live and breathe without the injustices we are facing in our current cities and societies. And so they were make, they were saying that in response to a question about reverse racism and, and allowing white people there and, and, and or people of any other race. And so they were saying, sure, you know, you can come here if you're pro-black and we just want to live without injustices. But there's a couple components there. One, to include that everyone should live without injustices. And so you should advocate for that for an entire community. Um, and, and also that you can live without injustices without another government, again, like a neighborhood or keeping to yourself and just laying low and, and out of the, you know, it, minimally interacting with the people on the quote outside. You, you can do that. You don't need government to say you can. And, and it's ironic to me that the government has to sign off on not only freedom, but on their idea of what the government that they oppose and that they want to go away from has to give them the approval to go away. Yeah, I don't. I don't see this happening. I think it's a, a publicity stunt. It's look like like I said. If you want to create the community, great. Freedom unincorporated. If uh, if you want to get two hundred families together, I don't care. And ever and everybody is a close knit community. Perfect. That's great. But you're right. Once you create once you create a government, you start creating a, oppression by its very definition. So so once you once you create this city and you put city hall up and you you start taxing the people, that means that you have to be willing to take what belongs to somebody else if they don't pay their taxes. Yep. That means you have to start taking a cut of what every business owner sells. That means you have to start taxing business owners on everything, including the chair they sit on and the de- and the computer sitting on their desk. That means that you have to start becoming exactly what you're trying to get away from. U- utopian ex- societies don't exist for a reason because utopia does not exist. No solutions, only it- trade-offs. Right. So the the best thing you could ever hope for is something similar to the old West, where you form your own little community and you just you do you do what you have to do. You live and you survive. 
the the some desire for the state government to give you a blessing is just disgusting. Preach. And I, I, I don't see. I don't see it passing. I, I even if, I, I just don't. I just don't see it passing. I, there's there's any new city. The first thing they have to do is raise funds. And how does that start? That's well. Sandy Springs was the first thing they did. They got a police force and they put them on 285. Started issuing tickets. They had to get revenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the other things they did is they started going into existing like apartment complexes and hitting them with code violations and collecting fines. Because they had to, they had to raise money, and they didn't want to, to start off by taxing the residents. They wanted to tax people who were not necessarily residents of Sandy Springs. So, parking tickets, apartment complexes. The owners don't live in Sandy Springs, and the residents that live in the apartments don't care if the apartment complex gets smacked with a fine. So that's the first thing that happens is they start stealing from the population. It, it it's a repeatable process. Uh, one of the few cities that I understand why they formed, one was Milton. They wanted to be separate from Fulton County. They wanted to be away from the city of Atlanta. So, but like I said, when you have cities like Atlanta, New York, Chicago, these cities are large municipalities. Atlanta takes up more than one county. So Atlanta having a central government is big enough to do it. But Dallas, Hiram, uh, the the little cities down there, the, these little, the little cities that dot the map, that however many, I mean, Hundreds and hundreds of cities that really don't add don't add anything to the lives of, of the people. And I, and the the line I would put on is, do you provide your own schools? At the city of Atlanta has its own schools. Mm-hmm. So if the city is educating the kids, I mean, if they are an entity, the city of Dallas does not educate its own kids. They're not an entity. You're going to make a lot Just, of people mad with that. I do it every week. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's true. And the teachers already hate Somebody. us. So. <laughs> I don't know if they hate you as much as they hate me. Oh, I know they don't. <laughs> That's why you always lo- you, you, you love for me to take the slings and arrows. Like, no, no, no. That was Dave. Dave's the. Yeah. yeah. Do you want his phone I'm number? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> he loves feedback. All right, Jess. As we're running long, what are your closing thoughts? Um, I just wanted to mention that. The IRS is going to, for the first time ever, and for the 2020 tax year, allow us to request correspondence in Spanish. Um, And if you, like, you can complete your tax return and then also, you know, going forward, like, ensure that if they have to call you or email or or not email, but send you letters, um, or I suppose even show up, that they can do it in Spanish. And so I know there's going to be a lot of outrage over that. However... I think this is a wonderful time to screw with the IRS and make them speak to you in Spanish when you don't speak Spanish. Like, what a way to troll. Waste their time. Make all their Spanish-speaking employees call you and send you letters and and show up to your house and be available at their offices and then be like, I don't, what is this about? I like the part in the story where they said, uh, underserved community. Who in the hell does the IRS serve? Yeah. If I'm being served by the IRS, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely want to be underserved. Yeah. yeah, I mean, an underserved community. Just lucky. <laughs> <laughs> underserved funny. community. What it should say is, in an effort to collect more taxes from people on the fringe, we're going to go ahead and and put it in Spanish. Make sure you understand. We really don't care. Yeah, we really don't care what language you speak as long as you pay. Mm. Sell drugs, we don't care. Pay pay your taxes. Your prostitute, we don't care. We want to cut of that action, so to speak. A video came out last week, and I shared it on my Facebook, and, and uh, we can share it on on the uh, uh, on our page. A video of a white officer arresting a black suspect. The suspect gets away from him, starts getting a fight, gets the officer on the ground, and, and starts and starts throwing punches. And the community, uh, the bystanders on the street, grab this guy, tackle him to the ground. And this is an all black crowd. There's one white guy there, and it's and it's the police officer. 
and they beat the teetotal snot out of this guy. I mean, it, it wouldn't be. I mean, if if a group of police officers had done this, I mean, mm-hmm. all of them would be fired. But uh, the big dude <laughs> wrestles him to the ground, and I mean, everybody from the crowd is just taking turns running up and kicking the guy in the ribs and stuff like that. I mean, it's uh, uh, just from a from a pure violent standpoint, it's great. So the the big dude finally <laughs> pushes everybody away. And he's got his knee on the back of this dude's neck. I mean, and he, so again, if this was an officer, he'd be fired. And the officer, and the officer uh, uh, gets, gets control. Uh, the, the dude that's holding him down helps him get the handcuffs on him. So backup finally shows up. And they show up, and they the one there was a chick that was kneeling kneeling on this dude too, and, the, and she gets up, walks away, and the other officer st- starts coming at the the guy that was helping, and this other officer's like, no, 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 he's cool, man, he's cool, he's cool, he's cool, he helped me, he's cool. But it was absolutely great to see community policing is we're not gonna we're not gonna let this happen. I don't know the backstory behind it. I don't know why the guy was being arrested. He could have been arrested for. From, for stealing from everybody that that came and took a shot at him, but that was the community saying, "No, this is not going to happen. You're not going to sit there and beat the snot out of this guy. We're not going to stand by and and roll on our cell phones and put it on World Star. This guy getting his ass handed to him." And the community stepped up and said, "No, this is not going to happen today." And put his ass on the ground, and he's going to have some sore ribs for the foreseeable future. So that made me happy. So thank you very much for listening. For Eric Cumbie, our editor, for Jessica Salagi, for Big Daddy Unlimited, our sponsor, I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week.